Many of you may have heard about Tiananmen Square and about how people fought for the rights. There's a story about that. A story about people who actually stood up to a corrupt government for the rights. Our story begins with Hu Yaobang. Hu Yaobang was born to a poor family and was lacking in the education department as a result. When he was just 14, he left home to join the communists and joined the Chinese Communist Party in 1933. He worked with Deng Xiaoping, the future party leader during the 30s and served as a political commissar during the Chinese Civil War. From 52 to 66, he was the head of the Young Communist League, but after the revolution, he was purged and rehabilitated twice. After many years within the party, in 1977, he was director of the party's organization department. In 1980, he became the secretary of the CCP, and in 81, he replaced Mao Zedong's handpicked successor as chairman of the party. As he was now the leader of China, he marked China's programs to speed up economic reform. He replaced the Maoist ideology with the ideology of seeking truth from facts and prevented a party's control over China. He purged Maoists and incompetent members from the party, and replaced them with young, educated folks. His death in 1989 lit the match that started the flame of the Tiananmen Square protests. <laughs> Chapter 2 Start of the protests The 15th of April Ordinary people began gathering at the monument to the people's heroes in Tiananmen Square to mourn Yao Pang's death. During the remainder of the day, the crowds grew and grew, and by midnight, there were more than a hundred people there. Under the anonymity of a crowd, the people began talking about pressing issues such as corruption, inflation, working conditions, etc. Workers began meeting at the plaza to discuss what to do next. He discussed the long work hours, inflation, the incompetence of current China's leaders, and discovered they all had similar experiences and similar views. The 17th of April, university students started marching down the streets in Beijing. These students were denouncing speculation and corruption, same things the workers had been discussing within themselves. The next day, Toko of starting their own organization began. Some went back to work to carry the movement there by pushing it to their co-workers. Following evenings, the workers kept meeting after work to discuss what should be done with the movement. As the 20th came, students staged a sit-in at the Xinhuamen entrance to the Zonghanyai compound containing the residences of the country's leaders. The peaceful sitting was broken up by policemen with batons. Workers went back to Tiananmen Square to deliver a speech denouncing the military after said event. The group challenged the party, their policies and their corruption. The 27th of April, from 50,000 to 100,000 university students marched down the streets to Tiananmen Square. However, they toned down the anti-communist messages, instead choosing to present as anti-corruption, anti-cryonism, and pro-party. Tensions grew between the conservative camp and the progressive camp, with the more conservative not following the movement, the more progressive supporting the movement. <laughs> Chapter 3 
Chapter 3 Escalation of the Violence A hunger strike began on the 13th of May, two days before Gorbachev's visit to China. Knowing his welcome ceremony would be at Tiananmen Square, and by afternoon of the same day, 300,000 were at the square. The hunger strikes continued and spread across the country. The protests were well ordered, and students would sing L'Internationale. Their hunger strikes earned them sympathy, and they started gaining international support. 20th of May, China's government declared martial law, it sent at least 30 divisions and up to 250,000 troops were sent to the capital. Tens of thousands of protesters blocked the military sentry into Beijing. The protesters informed soldiers on the current situation and encouraged them to join them. They provided the soldiers with food, water and shelter. And as no way forward was feasible, the army was withdrawn the 24th. Simultaneously, the students became less organized and Tiananmen Square became increasingly overcrowded. It got to the point where whoever had the loudspeaker was in charge. On the 1st of June, Li Peng denounced the protesters as terrorists and counter-revolutionaries, and the Ministry of State Security also encouraging martial law. The next day, newspaper called for the departure of students from Tiananmen Square. This outraged the protesters. Martial law was officially declared at 16.30 June 3. Plan was to get military forces into the square at 1 o'clock June 4 and have it cleared by 6 o'clock. <laughs> Chapter 4 Military Reaction The violent reaction started as an army Mitsubishi Jeep belonging to the People's Armed Police drove through a sidewalk in Mook City, killing three pedestrians and seriously injuring another. Around 550 people gathered. Police blocked people from entering the area and sent the dead and injured to a hospital down the road. The jeep had no license plates and the police began taking people away without any sort of investigation. This led to people suspecting they were dealing with martial troops. People in the crowd went to the jeep to further investigate. They uncovered military uniforms, maps and telephones. At midnight, June 3rd, students began broadcasting the word over the loudspeaker systems. They warned about troops traveling around the place, some in uniform, some carrying army rifles, others wearing everyday clothes and weapons such as knives, bats and other such things. They suggested that students and teachers should form roadblocks. The groups of students blocked off dozens of intersections. Up to this point, that had been successful. Army vehicles had been blocked. Their tires were punctured, and soldiers were surrounded. At 5, students got on their bicycles to protest at Chang'an Boulevard. All around Tiananmen Square, students had blocked off and isolated groups of soldiers. 21 army trucks were stopped and the soldiers were questioned about their motives. However, those soldiers did not respond to the questions. The ground was littered with provisions and the soldiers were assaulted. A bus full of soldiers closed all its windows. 
Citizens who'd been surrounding the bus in its midnight started banging on the windows, screaming and spitting at the bus. Many other buses were surrounded and had their tires punctured. Students got into one of the army buses and displayed the equipment inside on top of the bus. At 13, students flashed the V for Victory sign. They showed the tips of bayonets, military helmets and other such gear to show the crowd how they believe they had been successful at avoiding dispersal. However, this sense of victory did not last. At 14.30, hundreds of police officers began firing tear gas into the crowd, making them scurry for cover. However, they responded by attacking them back. They threw rocks and attacked the officers in response. At 17, the Siannamain Command Center, the AFW, or Autonomous Federation of Workers, began handing out self-defense weapons to the protesters, such as, such as clubs, cleavers, chains, and sharpened bamboo. They gathered over a thousand people to knock down a wall in a construction site and picked up bricks and steel from the construction site. At 1730, 3,000 martial law officers awaiting orders began retreating. This elicited applause from the crowd. At 18, the crowd was so packed, cyclists had to get off their bikes, and parents brought out children to view the event. The atmosphere kept growing thicker, as leaders broadcasted news of the protesters being attacked by police via loudspeakers. 1830. The Beijing Municipal Government and Martial Law Command issued an emergency announcement. They said, Beginning immediately, Beijing citizens must be on high alert. Please stay off the streets and away from Tiananmen Squares. All workers should remain at their posts and all citizens should stay at home to safeguard their lives. Their intentions were clear. The remaining protesters would be killed. Around 1930, men in white shirts and green pants merged in groups of twos and threes from the subway. They were unarmed and carrying identical bags. They did not garner much attention from the protesters. As such, they were not beat up. 20. Bright lights lit up the Chang'an Boulevard and Xiananmen Square, where the people were gathering. This did not affect the number of people entering, and citizens began shouting, This is our victory! 2030. Helicopters are now circling around the boulevard and over Xiananmen Square. Female students urged people to go back to campus and bring more people to defend Xiananmen Square. Going to march! Xiananmen Square! Why? Why? I think this is my duty! 21 o'clock. Citizens who heard the announcement had now gone home around the outskirts of the city to prevent the military from entering. Only around a thousand people were left. Troops heading from the west encountered their first blockade at Gongsufen. Students and citizens had formed the blockade. The anti-riot squad responded by firing rubber bullets and tear gas into the crowd. As military people fired warning shots into the air. But the people in determination showed no sign of fear. The troops planned to travel two kilometers. However, their progress was very slow as the citizens interfered. They threw rocks, bottles, and other rubbish they could find. By 2210, tens of thousands formed a human wall at Beifengwo to block the troops. They met each other at about 20 to 30 meters. Some of the crowd continued the rock throwing. Troops used megahorns to tell the citizens to disperse. However, they then decided only force would ensure they would get there in time. They began firing into the air and pointing their weapons at citizens. At 20 to 30, the troops began firing at the crowds. And as soon as people realized they were actually using live ammunition against them, they dispersed to not die. However, the roadblocks hurt them escaping. 
they were trampled and injured. A group of students wearing red headbands were informed that troops would be coming through Muxidi, and some yelled, let's break up some concrete, so people started breaking up the sidewalk and paving stones into chunks. People pedaled trikes loaded up with bricks and rocks, even trucks arrived. Their anticipation was confirmed as tear gas canisters came flying over buses stretched across the road. Some of the troops on foot came through the bridge. They were met with a rain of rubble. The troops marched through the bridge, chanting, If no one attacks me, I attack no one. But if people attack me, I must attack them. They pointed their weapons at the crowd and alternated between shooting up into the air and shooting at the crowd. People fell to the ground and the soldiers would fire. The people would shout, FASCIST! Hooligan government and murderers. Bullets ricocheted off of buildings as troops shot up because people threw stuff at them. Over a hundred civilians fell to the ground in pools of blood. They were rushed to a hospital by other civilians, many on bikes. Three residents in the buildings had been shot dead. Troops cleared the road, firing the whole time. Armored cars and army trucks drove into the Muxidi bridge. 23 o'clock Armed soldiers, armored cars and army trucks are now heading towards Tiananmen Square. After the troops passed, citizens parked electric buses across the streets and set them on fire to block more troops from coming in. Everyone in the Fuxing hospital was screaming out fascists animals and bloody massacre as they dealt with the hundreds of dead and injured. 1.30 The area surrounding Mok City was now deserted and covered in silence. However, on the other sides, hundreds of military vehicles were heading towards the square steel. At 7.10, armored cars and tanks went over Gong Sufen to break through the remaining roadblocks. At 7.25, armored cars began being attacked by tear gas. 10.30, people urged soldiers to get off their cars. Military vehicles were set on fire. Families waited outside the hospital in hopes to see their family members, uncertain whether they were still alive. At 16 o'clock, the morgue was open so relatives could identify the bodies. <laughs> Chapter 5 Its Immediate Effects Tiananmen Square was a turning point for the world. The average person saw the tyranny of China and the CCP hidden behind closed doors. The death toll is estimated to have been around 3,000 deaths, where the British estimated around 10,000 were killed. But if you ask China, you'll get a death toll of 241. Yeah. At the time, it was not announcing that China suppressed democracy and people's civil liberties. Its importance nowadays. The CCP continues being an oppressive force nowadays. Ask anyone who does not wish to be a part of the People's Republic of China. And Tiananmen Square is a subject banned from being taught in China to this day. We can draw direct parallels to the Hong Kong protests. We can only hope they'll have a better result. The Tiananmen Square massacre also serves as a way to learn the importance of a free democracy. Thank you.